All right, welcome everybody to another exciting, hyper exciting maybe, super duper exciting episode of Pollen 8 uh, here in Studio B. Um, so today we have uh, a really unusual and great... Unusual? Well, yeah, very unusual. I mean, uh, there's no question. This, this guy is unusual, okay? I mean, it, it, you could find other descriptors... But unusual will, will hmm. be the, the sort of polite one. Okay. I haven't heard that before. I like it. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So That's fine with me. I like unusual. All right. Unusual, Matt Steigerwald, um, best known as one of the finer chefs in the area. Um, and I, I don't like to call him a chef very often because uh, it goes to his head. But uh, anyway, Matt <laughs> yeah. is a head guy over really there nice. at Rapid Creek Cidery and uh, well known as... He will tell you about, I'm sure, um, the owner and operator of the Lincoln Cafe and the Lincoln Wine Bar. and uh, Not anymore. Not anymore. No, that's right. Yeah. Past. Past tense. Yeah. He was. Yeah. He's not completely past tense, but he, he just I'm still here, part. personally. Yeah. <laughs> Matt. Uh, so, Matt, I think, you know, you've been here at... Rapid Creek Cidery and associated with uh, Wilson's Orchard. For, 25 years? <laughs> yeah, it's like marriage. <laughs> Seems like forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For what? 2017, I'm thinking. I started November 2016. 2016. Before November. we were open. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We yeah. opened in April of 2017. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back in the days of rough cut barnwood and flies and... We, yeah. There are still some flies. Yeah, in there, yeah, just a certain time of the year. Yeah, but so and there's still rough cut barnwood. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. might even be rougher cut at this point. Yeah, our our uh, whole operation's a bit rough cut. Yes, um, but tell us a little bit about your sort of journey into this area, into this area of you know, into your career, uh, food. How did yeah. that all take place? Um. um we moved here in 2000. My wife, Michelle, got a job teaching at uh, Cornell College in Mount Vernon, where we live still. Um, and I had opened up two or three restaurants at that point. I was 32. Um, and uh, two or three restaurants in North Carolina. Worked at some really well-regarded places there as well. Um, and uh, she got a job out here, and I had never been to Iowa, and we came out. And uh, really enjoyed Mount Vernon and really enjoyed the area. Um, it wasn't something I was uh, used to seeing so much uh, sky, to be honest mm. with you. you know, <laughs> not that we lived in an urban setting, but it was a suburban, you know, more of a sort of a Iowa City feel to um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, came out here, did a couple small dinners in Mount Vernon for people, met some people, um, had a little bit of money saved up, used that with some people I met to open Lincoln Cafe in Mount Vernon, which was in the space that had been a restaurant that had closed recently, uh, fortuitously, and that was 2001. Um, and then that was great. I had a great time with that. Really, really enjoyed it. We always tried to, everybody said you can't make fancy food in a small town in Iowa, and um, it kind of proved them wrong, I think, pretty pretty well i'm pr pretty proud of that uh, obviously we offered things for the lo for local farmers driving through and um uh kind of um less sophisticated pals like yourself paul to having you know burgers and salads and stuff but we did three high-end things a night and uh that worked well and then in 2007 i bought uh what was called I forget the name of the wine bar. There's a wine bar had had opened down down the street from us because we didn't have a liquor license, and I bought that from them in 2007. Um, and uh, we op put a really good pizza oven in there in 2010, 2011. Um, and then I closed the cafe in 2013 and sold the wine bar in 2014 to Jesse Sauerbrei, and he runs it still. Mm -hmm. So. When I'm really interested in you coming to Iowa and hitting this uh, sort of common logic of, or established logic maybe, of, uh, yeah, high-end dining is for the big cities, mm. Chicago, 
maybe Chapel Hill and yeah. stuff, but certainly not right. for Mount Vernon or even maybe Cedar Rapids or something. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. And, and I mean, talk us through how that, yeah, I mean, that process in your mind of, well, I'm going to do it, but here's the way I'm going to do it. What was the sort of key ingredients that you saw as, as this? Well, make that definitely one of the key ingredients was finding local pro produce. Uh -huh. I mean, local products, basically. Um, it was tough. We, we, uh, when we first got here, we, I met um, Laura Krause over at Abbey Hills Farm. She was teaching at Cornell at the time. So that was an easy uh, introduction. And uh, she was growing organically. She's an amazing farmer and is one of the smartest people about corn. Uh, started buying things from her. And um, so that was kind of, I felt good about that because there was at least someone I could buy some local vegetables from. Um, but besides that, there wasn't a lot to offer me as a um, person who came from a place where probably 10 years ahead of the curve a little bit compared to Iowa in terms of small farms and organic farms and small agriculture. Um, but that was key to try to find some local vegetables. We did get stuff from Kroll's was doing some stuff at that time. Um, and so we buying stuff from them a little bit. Um, local eggs were even available at that time, which was great. A little bit of vegetables, but it was hard, but we only had three really main things on the menu every night. So, filling those three with some local stuff. I did that pretty well, I think. I mean, I could get some things from Laura and it worked. Um wasn't always local by any means. But it was it was important to try. Um and then even other products like um it was really tough for us to get like really fresh fish and stuff. Um meats, a lot of people were offering me really kind of low end stuff. Uh, the general acceptance it seemed like even for the higher end restaurants Cedar Rapids were and Iowa City was kind of a low bar. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really tried to push that up a little bit by reaching out to other uh, vendors from out of state that I feel like I had some influence in terms of getting them into the state, which I felt real good about. Uh, we found a few growers around Iowa, more towards uh, Des Moines, that were a little bit ahead. And we got some people bringing us stuff from there, pigs and um, even vegetables some as well. Um, so once we... Once I felt like we had a little bit of a foothold in that, I saw some growth coming in that direction. I, I really tried to push towards that a lot, um, and that was important. The other thing that I really found encouraging was that when I did make food that I liked, the response was positive. Hmm. There, you know, uh, I mean, of course there were those people that came in and said, I'm not paying what at that point was like $24 for a big ribeye. Uh, obviously it's twice that now almost, but, um, there were those people that came in and didn't like that and they didn't want that. And that, that's fine. You know, you're going to make your, you got to weed out people, you know? Um, and those people stopped coming, but thankfully there was a large enough population of people who really did like it and were interested in it and had been looking for it. Um, I think at that time there was also kind of a push in the national media, People were seeing more of the food network. Mm. Here's the kind of food you can get in Chicago. Uh, why can't we get it here? There was definitely a population of people that was hungry for it. Yeah. So something you said there is interesting to me. It's a bit of a side note, but so you yeah. started, I mean, I, I guess I've never really understood the, the chef deal where you know i mean how do you decide what's on a menu right is is it stuff that you like to eat yeah. i mean what you just said is i'm making stuff that i like to eat and i found out other people like to eat it too yeah right? yeah and we're willing to buy it is 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 that i mean when you're designing a menu is that how it works or i think that's the first uh that's the first line of decision making mm -hmm. um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna start off at least making something i don't want to eat um just because you need to enjoy your work every day and we're in the kitchen 10, 12 hours a day. And, uh, if you're not feeling good about what you're putting on the plate, you know, and you're not tasting going, man, that's good. Then you're wasting your time and you're not going to go home happy. Um, and I think that translates to some extent as well. Mm -hmm. Cause right. Cause if I'm making food that I'm not excited about, I just think there's some kind of internal spiritual transition to the plate that doesn't, make the diner happy. I mean, I'm not going to love making something I don't want to eat. No one, you know, you're, you're not going to love making an apple. You don't, you know, I mean, there's just no way to do things in your job that you hate that you're over proud. time. Yeah. That's going to make you happy. You know? yeah. So yes, it does start with what I want to eat. Um, 
But that's just the first thing. I think after that, you do think about what's available locally, what's in season. Um, and then at the end of that is how does the menu look balance-wise? Is there enough vegetable options? Are there too many spicy things, which kind of I lean towards, to be honest. Uh, you know, is it a spread out menu that can appeal to a certain crowd? But definitely you start with what you want to eat first. I mean, always. Yeah. I think any chef would. So we'll fast forward a little bit to today. And yeah. there are a lot more options for sort of local, yeah. locally produced vegetables and meats and stuff like that. Right. Um, how does that I mean, how big a part of your passion is that part of it? I mean, is it is it just that, or and it's maybe not just that, but is is the big thing about local produce that it just, as we have found out, I mean, this should not have been a big revelation, but, you know, you start to be involved in CSAs and stuff, and you're like, holy shit, this stuff really does taste phenomenal yeah. today. Yeah. Is, is that it, or is it the idea of you're supporting local, or is it? all the above or is yeah it- i mean i guess it's kind of all of the above but it does start with the taste i mean um i'll be honest there are some things offered by farmers that i'll taste and go eh, i just don't think it's great you know cabbage or something sometimes from certain people that are not great so i'm not going to buy it or i'm going to find a way to use it that i can kind of manipulate it more mm-hmm. right um but the flavor of local vegetables i mean it's really not unusual for us in you know, high harvest time, August, September, September, to have 90%, 95% of the vegetables on our menu. And we have a pretty big menu coming from within five to 10 miles, right? So we have, you know, maybe the things that aren't, and I, there have been times this year when I've listed, I thought, well, I'm going to list what vegetables are local for us. And instead, I list what vegetables aren't. Because, hmm. like, we're buying some potatoes from Idaho for French fries, the big, rusted, big, you know, 90 count baking potatoes. Um, and I think there's some onions. I think that was it. Um, I think maybe there was a cauliflower thing we put in a curry at one point. But besides that, you know, it's all local. I mean, you, you can put things on your menu um, all day long from this area. Uh, we deal with probably eight or nine farms that are in Johnson Erland County. Whereas, like I said before, when we were just starting out, there was Laura Krause at Abbey Hills in Lynn <laughs> County, you know, and, and that was it. And now it's just really exploded. It's great now hmm. for sure. So when I go back to my first experience, we moved here in 2006 and immediately fell in love with the food at the Lincoln cafe. I mean, where we lived overseas, food was super, super cheap. So the first right. time I saw the price tags up there, I was one of those guys who was like, yeah. holy shite. This well, you're a farmer. That's how farmers yeah, are. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Jeez, mom, yeah. we're not going to be able to no. we're, we're yeah. not gonna be able to put shoes on that That's kid right. this year. That's right. Yeah. Let's boil some potatoes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the food was, was truly... Uh, I, I, to say it was remarkable is really understating the, the fact that it, it was just, uh, it was almost a revelation to me that food could could synthesize that way, you know. I, 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 and, and, and then I, I, I remember distinctly one time about oh, a year or two later, because um, we would go up there on uh, special occasions kind of thing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, pack up the buggy and yep. take the kids up there. Stay so. overnight in Solon. Stay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, I, I got to talking to you. I, for, first of all, I, I identify this guy in the back. I mean, sweating like crazy. I, mm. I, this is the memory I have of you back yeah, there. Yeah, that was a hot it, kitchen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and you came back, and we, I said I wanted to talk to you about vinegar, and you were all pretty, pretty polite about it. But it's like, yeah, well, hopped vinegar is probably not something that's going to be really interesting to me. <laughs> but <laughs> right. yeah, okay, right. bring me a sample kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah, no, yeah. you wouldn't. It was yeah. uh, many. Well, I mean, uh, problem. I mean, when you tell that story, the first thing I think about is, you know, how much vinegar am I using? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm doing three entrees a night. Uh, you know, I mean, what am I going to use a gallon every three, four weeks? And and is it an ingredient? I mean, yes, I do like vinegar. I use it a lot. My foods are highly acidic. But is it an ingredient that I can really uh, that that I need to spend a lot of time on. Right. Yeah. 
No, and, and, and the reason I'm, I'm sort of going into that is it was a revelation to me that, I mean, hopped vinegar, to me, it was, it was just like an amazing product, I thought. It was, it's, <laughs> yeah. it was amazing. I'm sure it and was. And I've yet to have anybody that could ever find a very interesting application right. for right. it, right? So yeah. while it was a passion of mine, and it was a crafted product. We had aged this stuff a couple years and yeah. then put hops in it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it wasn't like something that fit into what, what you were doing up there, yeah. right? And and I think a lot of that translates in local agriculture where, for one thing, there's a lot of farmers that are production-oriented. You know, mm. They just want to grow this stuff, turn it over to somebody, you do something with yep. it, right? Yep. Whether or not kohlrabi is really interesting, mm. I, I want to grow kohlrabi or it grows well, or I want to grow red delicious apples. They grow well, but the market doesn't seem to want them or the restaurant mm -hmm. owners don't mm -hmm. seem to want them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can well imagine that sitting there, uh, you know, making food back there on the other side of, of the counter, if you will, um, in the kitchen, that... There's a, a barrage of options that you have in terms of nowadays with vendors and stuff like that, oh, with yeah. suppliers and stuff like that. Right. What do you find difficult in sorting those guys out? Or what, I mean, what are some of the challenges that you see in terms of saying, this is somebody that I can really work with, or these are the kind of products that I can talk about with. local or just yeah, in general I mean, local. Vending. Yeah, I mean, yeah. because the suppliers, it's easy, right? You yeah. say, well, these guys aren't delivering on time, or they're paying yeah. the ass, or they're too yeah. expensive. I'm going to find somebody else. But local, there's only so many to, to work with, right. first and foremost, yeah. right? And and it's almost a religion here yeah. for, among us, right? right. That yep. we're going to support local wherever we can. Yep. So, but what are some of the challenges of that? What are some of the the the, the you should do is if, if anybody is listening that that's, you know, producing stuff for, yeah. for our restaurant or for other restaurants in yeah. this area or wherever. I mean, what are some of the things? That well, I'll talk about vegetables first. Cause that's really the biggest push. Um, for me, I, you know, I was raised, uh, Catholic. So I have a little, I have, I have some guilt about things. So when I'm not ordering, I didn't McGivens, know that you were raised. Yeah. Catholic. Yeah. No. Oh yeah. All through, all through high school from, from you went one to 12. Yeah. Through. Yep. Small Did Catholic you have the school, nuns, small right? Catholic. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, right up through high school. Or? Oh yeah. 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 So did we. Through high school. Yeah. But the, the, the issue that I'm trying to get to is that I feel bad if I'm not buying from a local farmer mm. who's reached out to me. Right. So I've got seven or eight farmers I've texted just in the past hour at home. I mean, just, you know, like at the restaurant um, about what I want for tomorrow. And it's about balancing. Right. So you're like, well, I'm getting uh, cilantro from Angie. I could get tomatoes from her, too, because she's coming over here. But I don't have anything else I need from Forrest. So I'll try to get, you know, I, I really try to spread the love a little mm. bit. I mm. mean, obviously, we're not buying huge amounts. We're buying 10, 20 pounds of things. Uh, but. Um, it's difficult because it's such a different problem than I used to have. I mean, I used to buy as much as I could from Laura Krause when I first moved here. Now I feel like, uh, you know, I want to be everybody's best friend yeah. and you just can't, you know? So as hard as it is, uh, you know, I think the thing that farmers need to do is just be aggressive with sale. I mean, you know, they, they need to text me, they need to come out, they need to get, reach out to, to people. I mean, you know, I, I think just like any business, you know, drop off some samples, come by um that but also have things that people aren't growing mm. like if i want local parsley local cilantro I, there's one or two farmers are growing that right i mean i can get tomatoes when tomatoes in season from six different people right that's great i love them but if someone offers me you know something i use we use a lot of dill at the restaurant i really mm. love dill um do a lot of middle eastern cooking and i love that flavor and you know i've i've had one farmer this year who's even offered me dill. So of course I'm buying all my dill from them. So I think, you know, if you're a grower, you go to different places that you respect, you eat at those restaurants and you ask them what they're missing. Um, pricing is also mm. an option. I mean, I, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a big issue. Of course, there are farmers who um, really go out of their way. You know, I mean, their vegetables are pristine and they're more expensive. You know, I mean, it's all more expensive than what you'd get from, Lafredo Produce or U.S. Foods or Cisco or whatever, of course, but it's a hundred times better. I mean, it's worth that, especially since, since I'm not paying for it since you are. <laughs> but but I do think that there's a certain amount of difference between the most pristine vegetables you get in the back door and the extra dollar fifty a pound they are 
versus, well, these are a little bumpy. These are there's a little rough and ready, and they're a dollar fifty cheaper. Mm. So you have to kind of balance that, I think, as well. Um, but I, in terms of other growers, in terms of meats, um, grains, products, um, you know, that's an area I'd love to see grow because there's minimal. It's it's minimal. I mean, we use cornmeal and grits from um, um, early morning harvest, which is an Iowa farm. Um, you help us get a lot of lamb and beef from different people around the area. But um, there's a gentleman bringing me some quail tomorrow. Mm. That's I'm interested in seeing. He's an Iowa uh, grower. But that's an area I'd like to see grow more, that you do see on menus in Chicago, that the that, that all, all of their proteins and all their grains are even coming from 100 miles. And there's less of that than I wish there was. Yeah, and it's amazing, isn't it, given yeah. Iowa yeah. and its yeah. I mean, agricultural why is there, potential. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's... There's almost nothing in the deciduous. Tr- well, but it's harder, right? I mean, it, I mean, you, you can grow an acre of vegetables pretty easily. You know, you can put some cauliflower down, whatever, and grow it and sell it and you're done. But it seems like more of a commitment to be growing a grain or an animal. Maybe, maybe it's not, but it seems like it from my point of view. Yeah, I don't know that, you know, the, the, the issue right now, the growing issue right now is lockers and slaughter. You know, I mean, it, it's really, what do you do with that animal? Because, you know... I mean, Sarah and I have, well, she does most of the work on it, um, maybe 80, 90 ewes right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, you and, have that many? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you and many. there's just not that much day in, day out work. You know, there's chores. There's yeah. something you have to yeah. do once or twice or three times a day uh, with your animals, but it's not a big time commitment, to be honest. Right. It's very pleasant work, Yeah. Um, especially if it's not confinement based it's very very pleasant because you're yeah. outdoors and, and even in rough weather it's it's just nice to be out with animals yeah. but then you get to where it's time to harvest them yeah and the locker situation in iowa anyways right now is just intolerably difficult because yeah. there's so few a lot of lockers have gone out of business mm-hmm. and the ones that haven't are so overwhelmed with uh, orders for butchering that they don't have time. You know, right now, if, you, if you're if you a new customer to a lot of these people, you're not talking even next year. Mm-hmm. You're talking 2022 yeah, you, you a lot of times you before that. you can get a slot. Yeah. You know, and it it's just makes it freaking Well, then maybe that's, maybe that's what people are running into? I, I well, I, I mean... I mean, I'm that's one issue. Yeah. Um, the other issue is, you know, if you're, if you're farming... 2,200 or 4,000 acres of corn and you're all set up for corn and soybeans and corn and soybeans right. and corn and soybeans, it's pretty hard to, to change your operation. And then, I mean, what a lot of guys don't do around here is, is they raise stocker cattle. So they raise What's a that cow. Mean, stocker cattle? It, it means they're going to raise a cow from a calf. So they have the, they have the mother cows mm. producing calves yeah. and they're raising them up to a certain level and then they're selling them to be fattened. Oh, so, somewhere else. Yeah. And so Iowa is like an export agricultural economy, right? Mm-hmm, we, mm-hmm. I mean, by and large, everything we do gets shipped off. We might, right. we, we probably process a lot of pigs. We do process a lot yeah. of pigs and chickens and turkeys and eggs and stuff here. Um, but all that stuff is exported out. Yeah. The same way with stocker cattle. We don't even do the processing here. We, we don't do the feeding here. We, you know, most of that stuff is sent right. elsewhere. Yep. Fed a bunch of corn, fattened up, and then har- and then yeah. slaughtered. Yeah, yeah. Um, so to move even beyond, you know, I mean, they're already raising that calf up to ten months to year and a half, yeah. depending on what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but then they're not taking it that final step. It's a grass-fed animal by and large, right. When it's here, right. And that's what we've done is we've just said. Okay, we're going to finish that animal. Yeah. Like my neighbor Steve, yep. he takes our apple pumice, which is fairly good, relatively feed, yeah. good feed. I mean, akin to corn, not quite the right. uh, not quite the protein, not quite the carbs, but it's it's good feed. Mm-hmm. Cows love it, and we fatten them up on that, and then we have a an animal that I think eats pretty well, and yeah. uh, and 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 is I mean, it's not. The highly marbled, you know, corn-fed sure. kind of cow, but yep. it's a, it's got more flavor, I think, and it, yep. it makes yep. it makes uh, yep. for for good food. And and I think part of that is uh, what I one aspect of the when I opened up my first restaurant here in Iowa, I didn't mention is and that is education. Uh, I think there's a really there's still a good amount of education that I try to put on the plate 
for guests. Um, you know, I try to lure them in with something that they are familiar with and then try to put a word or two in or an item or two on the plate that maybe they're not familiar with. Right. So you're, you're, you're teaching, I think a little bit about, um, what kind of options there are for eating, you know? And, and I think that, I think that raising animals and raising vegetables is that way too, because mm-hmm. every year there's a new thing, right? I mean, no, no one was growing dill a few years ago for me. Now people are growing, you know, one person's growing dill, but for animals too, you know, when we do put something on the, uh, you know, what, what, when we do put an animal, put something that's raised differently or not what they're used to at their local restaurant, you know, whether it's grass fed or it's, there's a learning curve. Yeah. There's a, there's going to be, you know, the first month you have on the menu, some people are going to balk at it and be, you know, I didn't like the texture, da-da. but maybe they go home and they happen to see something about it in the New York Times or the paper and they read a little bit about why grass fed is better, try to get it home, their wife brings it in, their husband brings it in. And by the end of the year, that's all they want. Mm. So there's a certain amount of education that I think I feel responsible to do about different kinds of animals, different ways animals are raised that is an uphill climb for people in this area but i think we've done a good job with it here especially so how do you do that how 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 do you educate people i mean outside of the fact that when you go to rapid creek cider you got to have a freaking dictionary here to read the menu here (laughs) which is like got all these words that there's some of them that are multi-syllable i mean it's difficult Uh, yeah it is it is difficult for someone like you um but uh we actually have people that can read Oh yeah, that oh, come to, to the restaurant, oh. which I appreciate uh, when it happens. Um, and so, um, what I think we have to do is just what I was saying before: is uh, make food that you want to eat yourself. Um, I do try to pay attention to to national trends and national um, ideas in terms of big city restaurants. I love I love that. I love going to Chicago and eating out, um, but. At the same time, I think you have to have things that are familiar. So I do a little bit of both. I'll, I'll have some words like we've been doing a lot of kind of Middle Eastern foods in the past couple of years here. Um, you know, not, not your falafel and hummus. People know those things. But jug and kiba, things that people aren't familiar with, you try to get them on the menu with things that they are familiar with. So they read, you know, beef or they read, you know, jalapeno or chilies or... Uh, you know, a certain kind of rice that they're familiar with. And you throw that word in the description for me. And then the next time they come back, they're the one telling their buddy, oh, you don't know what Kibba is? Of course, you know, we had it last time we are here. You know what I mean? So it, I, I think there's a good amount of education that happens that way. And um, I'm always surprised that more people don't do that. You know, I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm always surprised when I, when I, you know, few times a year we'll do an event with restaurants or we'll go to you know restaurants or i'll talk to different chefs around the area and um i think there's a little bit of um i don't want to say laziness but there's a little bit of uh lack of pushing your self-education you know Mm. because i can't educate them unless i work hard to be educated so i i work hard on that myself you know i have thousands of cookbooks at home i buy whatever comes out by anybody i I'm interested in or a subject or a, or an author, or even if there's someone I like who does a blurb on the jacket, I'll probably buy that book, you know, because they like that book. Uh-huh. So you have to be aware of that stuff. I think to educate. So what do you think of the, the whole kind of mania around food network and all the, oh, yeah. you know, chef's table and all that? I mean, what, yeah. how, how does somebody like yourself, how, how do you look at that? Is it, is it mystifying or is it, it's about damn time or, yeah. I remember when I was, you know, younger, I'm still young, of course, compared to you, but young, I, younger, I would, um, when like Food Network just came out and it was, I mean, I'd have it on all day if I could, you know, it was like, what the hell? This is great. And you never see any videos, you know, this is pre YouTube, pre all that stuff. So I loved it then. I really did. Um, you know, I feel like, like some things, like things tend to do, it got out of control a little bit. Um, and you do meet young people who are really gung ho about the celebrity aspect of cooking, um, the shiny, you know, Mm. next shiny thing. They want to be part of that. Um, it's not really something that I look for in a young cook to hire or to work with, you know, um, 
they there's a certain amount of that, just like any kind of media, that just pushes into your brain constantly. And these young people, a, 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 a certain percentage of them, that's how they learned that they wanted to be chefs, right? Yeah. They see the TV, they see, you know, um, and then they try to do it and they think that they know how to do it because they because they've heard these words and they can't really do it properly. You know, they don't know that it's 12 hour days in a hot kitchen busting your ass. Um, they think it's a video they're making about, you know, how to saute some green beans or something, you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, but, but I think what's also interesting about that part of it is, is how far that's reached, you know, the, you know, the media about food, food network and all that stuff. I, I feel like we're saying, I'm saying I'm referencing food network, but I'm sure there's, six other more pertinent outlets now that I just am not aware of, but that's what I grew up on, you know, mm-hmm. Food Network. And um, it just seems like uh, like there's nothing to learn from those things. You're not learning from that. You're just getting the outside it's veneer the entertainment of it. Value. Yeah, and, and that's just really frustrating to me because a lot of kids come up and they don't know what they're talking about. I hate to be that old guy that says, yeah, young whippersnappers. <laughs> and, and by far, I have hired and engaged with and worked with and loved some of the young people who go to Kirkwood Culinary. Um, and, and there's been a good amount of people that have left Iowa and come back. You know, I've got some friends that have left Iowa and come back to open restaurants once they've had a family and gotten married and stuff. And that's wonderful to see because you know they're in it for the good. You know, it's great to see that. And they are seeding a lot of different stuff, right? I mean, I, I, I just... Know like Andrew up there and, and what he's doing in Cedar Rapids and, yeah. and different people yeah. around you know are sort of spreading uh, spreading their influence their food influence their their, their chefing influence yeah. will in in and amongst that that uh, that area that geography and it's it really is yeah. up in the game I yeah mean, it's no it, it, it's definitely so much better than it was twenty years ago um, but I mean. With a lot of things, it's true. Things start on the coast, and so they move inward. You know, we're pretty far inward. Yeah. You can't get much more inward. And so, you know, there are those trends and those things that, that I feel like I try to stay aware of and um, that, you know, you still get people looking at you sideways about. Um, but what also I think is interesting is the past five years, probably more than that, we've, we've had, we have those Food Network people reaching out to Iowa. Mm. You know, like, what, you know, what... I think they're running out of people on the coast because <laughs> they're, you know, I mean, I just got a call four days ago from Food Network wanted to see if I was interested in talking about doing something. And that does happen. I'm sure it happens to a lot of chefs around here every year or two, right? Um, and nothing's very attractive about that to me, of course. You know, there are people that have done a good job with it, but it's not something that I think furthers my career or makes me happy to see myself involved with. But yeah, I mean, there's... There's a lot more, a lot more food knowledge here than there was 20 years ago by far. Um, I can do anything on the menu now and feel like a certain percentage of people is going to be attracted to it. Mm. I don't, I don't worry. I have, I don't have any guidelines now, whereas I think I did 10 years ago even. Mm. You were, you felt like you were constrained more. You, you, there were some definite for sure bumpers that that kept you in a certain lane. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I do like. Uh, uh, Persian food sometimes mm. on the, on our menu here. I mean, I couldn't see that. I couldn't see anybody buying that outside of, you know, uh, like a hero stand or a, a international market in white Iowa 10 years ago. Just mm. wasn't a lot of it. I mean, there's definitely pockets maybe in Des Moines of that of type of things like that. But now I'll sell 10 to 20 of something on the menu that's – I think is fairly unfamiliar to people. And I think it is unfamiliar to them, but I think that they have come to trust us in terms of flavors. I think there's yeah. a lot of truth to yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Here, better. I'll take a little more of that. Yeah. That's good. That's good. bit crunchy at the end there. You know, uh, what I think is interesting about... It's Rap- very hard for me to say, to be honest. Ra- Rapid Creek is that my kitchen staff at Rapid Creek, 
when I go to friends' restaurants in Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, a lot of the cooks there are young, very young. Mm. And they're very into what we were just talking about in terms of, I mean, you can tell by looking at them. They've spent $400 on a knife. They probably saved up all year for it, right? They've, you know, they, they've got the jackets. They've got the, they know the, you know, the high-end chef from Chicago who just made the news because of some dish, you know. There was, uh, and, and I think there's, some, there's a lot of that around. And I just feel like I'm really proud of how we've grown a kitchen staff that is, I feel like, a little more organic, a little more, um, maybe a little older, you know. Mm skews a little older than that and uh um understands what we're trying to do and isn't turning their head to every shiny thing that comes around the corner i'm really happy with that i'm really 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 well that's an interesting thing because that was sort of where i was going to in my head was you know because there are so many as we've become a sort of foodie obsessed subculture as that, as that's developed and grown and and you know sort of become americanized in in, mm-hmm. in ways yeah. that marketing takes over and, yeah. and you know it's become very faddish right i mean yeah. let's let's be honest there, yeah. there's just a lot of i was just reading through the sort of what's the new trends for 2021 in food yeah. you know and it's like this and that and the other thing and you just think you know there's only one of these that is probably sustainable in terms of right. long term yeah most of them are just flash in the pan yeah for fads. sure for sure. So how do you weed all that out? I mean, and you're reading all these yeah. covers and stuff, and I mean, you, you know, appearances notwithstanding, you're you're getting yeah, to be an old guy, true. so you're wisened and yeah. all this stuff. Uh, I I think it goes back to making what you want to eat. I mean, you know, it's just trusting your instincts. Mm-hmm. You know, you we all have a shirt, you know, you know, like a certain amount of bullshit meter that we follow internally, and you can open up any food magazine or go on any food website and within five minutes realize that that's no one's doing that's ridiculous that's not for that's not for us that's not what we're interested in um it's just about a fashion you know i mean it's just about there are things in there that are just about fashion that are just about some celebrity put it on twitter that they made this stupid cake or whatever it is and then it grips and keeps going and you just I think you just ignore it. You know, you just have to find what you want to eat and you ignore it. Uh, you know, I mean, you, I do find those people who I am attracted to in terms of their taste and food, you know. I mean, there are those chefs out there. There are those um, public figures uh, that, you, that you're drawn to because they ring true to you in terms of their personality, their style, um, their work ethic, you know there are definitely those people who you are drawn to, you know, and, and those, those flavors. I mean, uh, my wife's from Southern Louisiana. So, you know, I go to New Orleans as often as I can. We go to Opelousas where she's from. Um, and you, you know, you, if someone has, if someone's a chef in Louisiana, uh, I, I almost think they're just, they're just built to, have a good sense of it. You know what oh. I mean? They, they know food, you know I mean? They wake up in the morning, you talk about what's for dinner all day. You know, I bring it up. We're having a cup of coffee in the morning at home. Michelle's like, it's eight o'clock in the morning. Why are you asking me what's for dinner? You know, <laughs> I mean, she, I think came from that, but you know, what, when we, when you go to different parts of the country that are really into food. And I think, to be honest, I think Southern Louisiana would probably be one of the last bastions of really kind of, uh, insular food culture um you know you're drawn to people who are who love it Mm. yeah i mean they love it down there right so we do a lot of louisiana food i love that um i'm drawn to cultures where food is community Um, sometimes in iowa i feel like food is uh secondary thought you know i have i have this um this um, food is important was a thing i did at at the lincoln cafe and people got tattoos of it and food is important and when I first moved here, I didn't, food didn't seem important to these mm. people here. It's gotten more so. But so I'm drawn to cultures where food is important and food brings people together. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of Middle Eastern cultures where it's, you know, it's about the group getting together. There's a lot of people in the South where I think Sunday after church get it together. You having, and you know, I'm not saying it doesn't happen in the Midwest. It does, but when I see the food that's brought to those events. Overall, historically, I feel like there's been a little more of my soul that is attracted to certain cultures. 
Um, not sure how we got down this road, but I, I just feel like the way you decide what you love is by seeing other people eat and do what you love and you're just drawn to it internally. And I'm just drawn to that, you know, for, I'm really drawn to, you know, there's a lot of places in Mexico that I've been where the whole town is focused on a certain food group, food source, you know, um, you go to Oaxaca, it's like, you know, there's a certain amount of people in the square eating something every day and they wait for it and they come there and they get it and there's tortillas and there's mole. It's just, it just feels like something that's, um, much more ingrained Mm -hmm. in your day, you know? And if you can find people that do what you love in that world, then of course you're drawn to them, you know? And I'm just not drawn to some of those celebrity media things. Yeah. And I mean, here in the Midwest, I mean, growing up in Michigan and, you know, I think there was a lot more direct connection with, um, you know, homemade foods and, uh, you know, largely for my generation, it was grandma and her, yeah. you know, my yeah. grandma was an amazing baker and yeah. well, on both sides, they, yeah. they were, they were great cooks, you know, they, they just were, and they made chicken yeah. and dumplings or some Midwest staple like meatloaf or whatever. It was amazing. You yeah. Know, it was, yeah. it was phenomenal. Yeah. But those skills have really changed. Well, a lot, I, I think, think for whatever reason, and I, I'm trying to think what the reason could be, there are those, uh, local cultures in the U S where, um, fast food, let's call it fast food as a, as a general thing Mm -hmm. took hold, right. When it was available and when, uh, convenience was available, took hold. And I think there are still those places around the country and around the world, of course, around the world where it hasn't, where it didn't take hold. And, um, I mean, like if you talk about, about Louisiana or Southern Louisiana, uh, New Orleans, I mean, of course, there's fast food. Of course, there's Walmarts. But um, there's a sense of the culture mm. that a certain strength of pride in the foods that they make by hand every day that some places I think are missing. You know, yeah. I, And I, I mean, I didn't mean to say that the Midwest doesn't have that great, you know, history of foods. I mean, there are, I remember one of the first books I got when I moved here was about the the like foods in the Midwest, right? Mm-hmm. Foods of Iowa. And it was, it was wonderful. But I remember thinking a lot of these recipes are from like the fifties. Mm-hmm. Like what about foods in Iowa now that are growing and changing with different cultures and different young people growing up? I think the other problem to skip ahead a little bit, and it's changed somewhat here is that a lot of places around the country are seeing a, a resurgence in um, immigrant culture and immigrant, uh, food waste, right? Um, we, you know, there is some, um, there's definitely some, uh, Hispanic influence happening in Iowa, more maybe to Des Moines and the West or half the state, but, um, we don't have that very much, right? So it's kind of, it's kind of like a monoculture, right? There's not been a lot of influence from other things to kind of make it interesting and, um, places, places like, New Orleans, Louisiana. I mean, you got Spanish influence, Italian influence. Now there's like Viet Cajun food, mm. right? So there's Vietnamese Cajun food that's that's actually like become relevant and become mm. a its own thing, you know. And you wouldn't have thought that 20 years ago, but now it's respectable. And we don't have that influence here as much, you know. I, we have people growing up in Eastern Iowa, and like I said before, people leaving and coming back is great, but there's just not a lot of other cultures bringing their ideas into it. And that's been a really big part of the, of the recent um, national food trend is, you know, first generation Korean or uh, Southeast Asian or Mexican coming into cultures. And now those people are 25, 35 years old and learning what their grandma's made and their mom's made and working in restaurants that are, European based in terms of, you know, long term European based cooking and having an influence on it and changing it to make new things. So I you have to make new things to make it good and, and I think that that um that when I see places where that's ha- that's happening, you're just drawn to it. You know, you're yeah. auto- automatically drawn to it. Well I think, you know, the one thing I take away from living overseas is I mean the 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 common view 
from a lot of other cultures towards America is, I mean, we just don't have that food is important right. running through our head. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's not in our blood. It's yeah. like food is a sustenance thing. Sustenance, or it's, exactly. It's a, it's a marketing-driven thing, just yeah. like, you know, what clothes you wear and what yeah, food yeah. you're going to buy yeah. and shit like that. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, yeah. I, I think there are I mean, precious <laughs> few little pockets maybe maybe louisiana is one um you know there could be some other parts as well whether ethnic or whatever where food has remained very big part of people's lives but that's the exception not the norm here yeah for sure and so for us it seems like we're a lot more dependent on sort of fusion of different cultures and and the input of new ideas and things like that and that's as we know i mean it's slower in the midwest let's just i mean it it is yeah i wonder what that sort of sense of sustenance or like a sense of scarcity almost comes from. I mean, I, I want to say with things I've read about the history of um, European influence on American food, there's, there's that sort of um, um, Northern European uh, British Isles sort of um, scarcity, like, you know, like a sense of like potatoes and cabbage and, Mm -hmm. There's, you know, you're just, you know, it's a hard scrabble life to a certain extent. And what are you worrying about for dinner? Let's make sure we have something to eat right now for breakfast. Um, I think that's probably part of it. I mean, I wouldn't want to speak knowledgeably about it beyond that. But, yeah, I, that's something that I definitely didn't experience growing up on the East Coast. I mean, um, there was, you know, I remember my, my mom bringing me to, you know, local Asian restaurants when I was a kid or going to, you know, the health food market I have older sisters and they're all kind of um when i was a kid i saw them all as kind of uh hippies mm. i mean they were a little young for that but there was definitely a lot of tofu in my childhood growing up and you know no one heard of tofu. and this this is you know late 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 70s and like you know three blocks from the mall in raleigh north carolina i mean it was so those little pockets of people kind of doing interesting food or trying interesting food or being aware of it um are everywhere but Definitely a little more scarce here, for whatever reason. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting, partly in, in with regards to what happens down the road, right? I mean, you, so you're, you're looking at a culture that is, I wouldn't say not rooted deeply in, in sort of food preparation, but certainly, you know, we're very... Um, we, we touch we touch food preparation fairly lightly as a culture. I think food is relatively cheap. Yeah. Um, fast food, however you define it, is ubiquitous and and probably the biggest source. You have a situation where, what the information I just read about was uh, like half of our meals are eaten outside the home or prepared right. outside the home at this yeah. point. Yeah. Right. So. Um, the question is what what comes next because at, at the same time you have this convergence where you have a culture that doesn't have a lot of time and is eating out or eating other people's preparations more often you have um, you know notwithstanding the current political environment you have a lot of immigrants and their food cultures coming in and, and for a lot of these cultures food is very central yeah. to their yeah. identity right yeah. I mean uh, you know, Hispanics that I grew up with, um, you know, they wouldn't eat meatloaf, you know, I mean, it just, it was out of the question. It was going to be mole or tortillas or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so then you look forward and you say, well, well, what's next for us, right? You have an interest in food. There's a very dynamic and I think deep seated interest in people and COVID has just brought it to the fore all the more. Yeah. Um, and, and what's next as we go forward is, are we going to sort of look more like Italy, you know, in the future where, mm-hmm. where food and its preparation becomes really central to our lives? Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. are we going to maintain this sort of McDonald's, yeah. you know, whatever's cheap and, yeah. and easy as us? I mean, you know, it's, it's, I'm no sociologist, but it seems like the way American culture is moving, it's splitting. You know, there's the division, right? So you have more and more people buying in these sort of like home cooking me- uh, kits or uh, going out to eat or getting food delivered their, to their home. I mean, pe- people I know, especially in Iowa City, get food delivered to their home multiple times a week, you know, prepared food multiple times a week. I don't 
I can't remember getting food delivered in my home ever, you know, maybe a pizza at some point. But um, so I guess I would say the future is those people who care will keep caring and the people who don't care will keep not caring. Hmm. You know, I mean, I, it's just going to be that way. I, uh, I hope people who care tend to outnumber people who don't care. Um, but there's no guarantee. I mean, you know, American culture is into automation and into making money. And I get that. That's great. But that's food and what you're eating every day is not a place to necessarily focus on automation or making money or mm. being cheap with it. Mm. I, you know, there's no reason to be cheap with it. Um, and there's no reason to have someone else do it for you. I mean, I always think people love to cook. I feel like there's been a resurgence in cooking in the past 10 years. But when I bring it up to people, they often say to me, no one cooks. They have the food delivered, you know. Like I, I kind of thought people were cooking more, you know, I'm talking to Jacob about this, you know, and he, he says, well, people are actually cooking less. I just don't, I don't really get that. I, I think people are interested in more in food than mm-hmm. they were 10 years ago. So I assume that means cooking more, but maybe it's just a split. Maybe there are those people who are really interested in it, but hopefully not too many because I want them to come out to Rapid Creek and eat, <laughs> eat, eat dinner instead of cooking every night. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't I tend to think there's just, just a little bit of a split, you know. I mean, it's hard to say what each generation is going to happen, going to do. But I do think that, like I said before, the more different cultures and different ideas mix with whatever culture you're in, uh, the more interesting the food's going to be. And uh, interesting, I think, equates to better in some way in terms of food, you know. Yeah, well, we've certainly seen it here. I mean, just in Iowa City, you know, you've got now authentic. Mexican food. I mean, it's not the authentic that's on the billboards of most of these restaurants. It's, it's yeah. you know, it's pucka uh, authentic food. We pucka? Have pucka. Yeah. What's that mean? Actual or, yeah. Pucka? Pucka, yeah. I've never heard that word. I think, I think it's... P-U-K-K-A? P-U-C-K-A. I think it's like fucka without the... Yeah. I never heard that yeah. word. Pucka, I think it's actually Hindu. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's Hindu. Okay. So you have actual... Um, whatever I was talking about. Yeah, we have real of, Mexican food. Yeah, in, real in, Mexican in food. I, I and we have that. real Chinese food now, partly as a result of yeah. the fact that we have a growing Hispanic community and we have and a, U of a, I brings and, in and the University of Iowa brings a lot, a lot of, of Asian uh, culture, a lot of Asians sure. yeah. here and, and they're yeah. looking for yeah. for true blue yeah. Chinese food. And, and that's Mexican. great. Yeah, it is yeah. great. It is great. And then that, I think, will will definitely continue. Let's hope so. Yeah. So one other thing I've been kind of toying around with whether I should bring it up or not, but I'm going to just go ahead and throw it out there because it's it's this whole idea of chef, okay? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I found about you uh, when we first started talking about you coming here, or maybe it was after we already, I guess you were already here, and you made the point, whether to me or somebody else I don't remember, about don't call me chef, Right. Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. Chef Matt, right? Because there, there's a yeah. very, very prominent local guy here that I met early on. And I was quite put off because he insisted that I call him Chef <laughs> and then his name, <laughs> okay. right? I mean, yeah. that's the only way you could address yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I felt like, you know, do I have to bow at the right. same time or, you know, just a curtsy is okay? Or, yeah. you know, I can't turn my back to you right. as you don't I walk do out the door. Yep. Or back what's out. the, you what's the back deal? Out. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just a personal choice. I mean, I don't, I don't mind it. There are cooks I've worked with that call me chef, and I respond to it now. I probably wouldn't have 10 years ago, mm. even though I had opened five restaurants. But um, I think it's just a, it just comes from that French-European, you know, uh. you know, hierarchy, you know, military-based sort of thing where there's one person in charge, obviously usually a male at that point in France, always probably at that point in France. And, and it's just become that sort of like military based titles. Right. Mm -hmm. So every station in the kitchen, every person has their title. Um, I don't, I've just never really used them because I didn't grow up in restaurants that used them and because I'm not too formal a person in general. So I, I mean, there are people that call me chef cooks that call me chef, but I'm fine with Matt. I'm fine with, um, your highness, whatever you, you know, <laughs> works for you, works, works for me. Okay. Uh, but I do think also that, you know, I think the, I think the chef thing, I'm just un, uncomfortable with too much, um, 
what's the word? Uh, too much formality. Formality, and you know, I mean, I, I mean, I rely on my cooks every day to have just as many ideas as I have. I'm relying on Caitlin and Shogi and Jesse to have those ideas every day and to have input on dishes. And I welcome it, you know, wholeheartedly. I'm not always going to use it. I use it when I can or when I think it's appropriate. But without it, I mean, it would be a mess, you know. I mean, so we're all chefs. I mean, there. I mean, you know, the best restaurants, I think, everybody's called a chef the minute you start working there, right? That's great because you're, you're a chef. I'm a chef. We're all chefs. But... Um, yeah, I just it's just a lack of formality. I mean, I don't wear a chef's jacket in the, in the kitchen. I'm fairly proud of not making my cooks wear chef jackets. I feel like there's a comfortable uh, aspect to it. Um, you know, I don't I don't want to be that. I don't want to separate from the people we're dining with. You know, who are dining there. I mean, that's a whole other hour conversation. We talk about the dining room and what I think of the guests and you know how we want to present ourselves to them. But um, I definitely don't want to feel separate from them. And I want to feel like, you know, generally I try not to have the cooks, you know, wear big Nike shirts and things like that. Um, this year I let that go because we started doing takeout and it's kind of evolved and I haven't pushed it. But, yeah, I just feel like it should be a relaxed space and relaxed people and having a good time. I and mean, we've always wanted that. Even when we, we, you know, when we opened RCC, we talked about it, you know. Mm-hmm. We want to have that space be a space of celebration the space of community and i think separating the kitchen from the dining room is it is not that it detracts from yeah that. yeah it detracts from that for sure yeah. hmm. so as i mean if if uh and here it is the 18th of october and it's snowing, snowing a little bit yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's weird yeah um so as we look at the sort of tendencies uh, looking down the road. I mean, COVID has sort of accelerated some of this, right? In terms of the takeout dining, everybody's gone to pretty much takeout dining that, you know, hasn't closed their doors. So many restaurants <clears throat> have gone to takeout menus, ourselves included, that, that didn't really used to do much of that. And then delivery and stuff like that. What kind of additional sort of challenges does that present to a to a, a chef that's interested in you know, really good quality food, you know, because I know, I mean, I, I'm just freaking floored all the time uh, at, at this sort of almost anal uh, attention to how, how hot is this food? You know, how do I serve this? You know, I mean, it, it's, yeah. it, it's just That's a like, nightmare. yeah. So how do you, how do you work that around you know, somebody that's coming and grabbing this thing and, oh, by the way, they're 15 minutes late. And yeah. The food's been sitting there. I mean, that's a nightmare. Yeah, you know, I, I really, I, I, I can't, I, you know, it's very stressful. Um, I try to push the takeout menu to more room temperature or cold things, uh, dips, spreads. You know, the problem is it doesn't allow for much creativity. It doesn't allow someone to make a meal out of it usually. It's usually an addition to something that we're eating at home. Um, we have moved recently towards, uh, cold take home stuff like full family dinners that are cold that you reheat with, re- you know, reheating instructions. Um, I don't, don't have a lot of experience with it, so I never really had to do it before. I mean, I, you know, my attitude, most chefs attitude in, in the sort of restaurants that I grew up in and I raised in, um, you know, you, you know, you, you push back on the takeaway, you know, mm. I don't want, no, they can't have that takeaway. They can have a salad, they can have a burger, but no, I'm not doing that pork entree for takeaway. It's going to suck by the time I get home. And I'm going to feel stupid because they're going to go, this isn't very good. Mm. And then you feel like, well, that's my fault, but it's not my fault because you, it's not built to be taken. You know, Mm. it's not, it's not built for longevity. It's built to be put on the plate and get out there. That's the high end food thing, right? I mean, definitely less of that now than at like the Lincoln when there was eight garnishes and we didn't let anybody take anything out of there. But, um, but it presents a real problem in terms of how to make a menu that people will be happy with at home. Um, like I said, we're doing more cold things, take home reheat. Um, I think I, I'd like to try to do some things that are a little bit of both. We have talked to um, Katie about this, but trying to do some things that are um, like a, like a full meal and some of it is ready to go and some of it you need to cook. So people can feel like they're making dinner with a little help for me, but I'm not there. You know, uh, maybe the 
shrimp is marinated but raw uh, and here's instructions how to cook it quickly on the grill or whatever but the but the sauces are ready uh, the pasta is cooked or whatever it is the grate is cooked to be reheated um, so just a little bit of both of that is helpful it's, but it is a puzzle it's a real puzzle putting it together you know I like to have a theme to the dinners if I can for take home um, but it's finding those things that work I mean the 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 whole game with prepping food in a restaurant in our kind of restaurant is how far can you take a dish without losing quality during service you know because you want to cut back as much work during service as you can without losing quality right so you know if i'm gonna roast the chickens ahead of time or something like that well they're not going to hold that well so they're going to lose quality but i can make this sauce and that sauce and hold it cold and reheat it it's, it's that whole game of you know how little work can I do during service so I can focus on the plate versus prep. And I think that's just, we work hard. I work hard and I will be working hard, especially this winter as we're trying to push more takeout stuff to get dishes to be easy for people at home to finish. So they don't have to put in the microwave maybe, you know, but they got to finish it. They got to do a little effort. And to me, the second advantage to that is maybe you're teaching someone to cook a little bit mm. and i really like that idea yeah yeah all right well hey cheers, cheers to you. yeah thank yeah. you yeah thanks for coming by again matt steigerwald uh head poobah chef whatever the hell you want to call him poobah poobah that's a good one at rapid creek cidery uh, you can check out their menu and all that stuff online i'm sure facebook whatever the hell else you follow um but yeah uh thanks for joining us again today uh another super titillating episode of pollinate here at studio b at uh, wilson's orchard and farm yeah come back see us again and again uh if you see anything in this that's remotely interesting or something you'd be interested in let us know we'll see if there's anybody around that's got the wherewithal to provide that kind of information cheers Thank you.